long is this going to take? It shouldn't take a whole lot longer. Do you think I can get there before 129? Um, probably not. Uh, What's at 129? Well, I had a project to 164. Okay. of the wrongful conviction of Brennan Dassey. Over the course of season two, we explore the constitutional errors at the heart of this injustice, the chaos of Kaczynski, and the techniques responsible for determining Brendan's fate. The conversation continues. Welcome to the sixth hour. years. I've spent hours, days at a time, buried under the weight of the wrongful conviction of a Michigan High School special ed student who had gone to school on February the 27th, 2006, as an innocent 16-year-old kid, only to experience a macabre initiation into adulthood at the hands of local law enforcement when he left as a suspect in one of Wisconsin's most notorious criminal investigations. This profound miscarriage of justice is Brendan's story. I just have a seat, Brendan. Tom and I just gotta stop out for a minute and then we'll be ready in, okay? Okay. All right. Stephen Avery's attorneys face a different task than us. The case against Stephen Avery is a case that's built on forensics, on blood evidence, on things like that. Soda, water, you sure? Well, water, maybe. Okay. The case against Brendan Dassey, there's no scientific evidence pinning him to this crime. The case against Brendan Dassey is words and words only. I have a question, though. How long is this going to take? You think I can get there before 129? Oh. I have a project due in sixth hour, said Brendan to Uyghur, after agreeing to a highly inculpatory account of murder. Can I go tomorrow? The foundation of this podcast is predicated on these virtuous comments made by Brendan Dassey. So how does a 16-year-old child with significant intellectual and social challenges find himself tried and convicted in a case in which there is zero physical evidence tying him to a crime that he can't even describe? Why did the jury convict in haste, taking a mere four hours to diminish the life not yet lived of a juvenile? Now, law enforcement officers can lie to those suspected of committing a crime and have been enabled by Fraser v. Cup, a Supreme Court case that gave license to officers to use deception during interrogations. And they have done with absolute abandonment for more than 50 plus years. But does it give license to prosecutors while addressing the jury in closing arguments to do the very same thing. Seemingly state prosecutor Tom Fallon thought so when he implored the jury to believe that innocent people don't confess. As Judge Rovner in her en banc dissent noted, we know, however, that this statement is unequivocally incorrect. Innocent people do in fact confess and they do so with shocking regularity. But by the end of day, April the 25th, 2007, 
Fallon's falsity would be partially liable for an erroneous guilty verdict. Advancements in adolescent neuroscience and its intersection with criminal liability is backed by decades of scientific research and forensic studies and evidence from false confession exoneration cases. And all of this speaks to why this anomalous concept is particularly true for juveniles, and more so for juveniles with intellectual disabilities and profound speech and language impairments. Tragically, horrendously, Brendan was propelled headfirst into the quagmire of judicial ignorance. Even the US Supreme Court acknowledges that juveniles, by virtue of their inherent psychological and neurobiological immaturity, are not as responsible for their behaviour as adults. Yet the Wisconsin trial and appellate courts looked not to precedent, but settled into the warm nook of ineptness and failed dismally in their constitutional duty to review Brennan's interrogation with the special care required by the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's recognition that children, and and that is individuals under the age of 18 at the time of the crime, are different, has led many states to revisit the sentencing of children in adult criminal courts. Yet so far, and unsurprisingly, Wisconsin has not followed suit. Yet the governor tells us he believes in science. All science? Or is that an arbitrary take too, I wonder? Governor Evers looks to address juvenile justice and the greater criminal justice system in his current budget proposals. But within Wisconsin correctional facilities, at this moment, There are 127 men serving life sentences for homicides committed when they were under 18 years of age. Outrageously, Brendan Dassey is one of them. Did you know that a life sentence is mandatory for persons convicted of homicide in Wisconsin? And judges like Judge Fox, however, have had discretion to set dates for, in brackets, offenders to be considered for release or parole or extended supervision. But what about the innocent? What about the wrongfully convicted? What about Brendan? According to constitutional law, the government may not coerce confessions, as provided by the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. Yet two investigators in small-town Manitowoc did just that. In 2006. And that remains to be corrected. Despite the science, despite the research, despite the innocence. In this episode of The Sixth Hour, I am joined by the co founder and chief legal officer of Juvenile Law Center, America's oldest public interest law firm for children, Professor Marsha Levick. Not only on the board of the Louisiana Center for Children's Rights, a member of the Dean's Council of the Indiana University School of Public and Environmental Affairs, she's been honored for her work by the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and American Bar Associations, the American Association for Justice, and received the Philadelphia Inquirer 2009 Citizen of the Year Award, and so, so much more. Professor Levick is an adjunct professor at Temple University Beasley School of Law and the University of Pennsylvania Law School and co-authored the Lead Child Advocates Amicus Briefs in key United States Supreme Court cases, included Roper v. Simmons, Graham v. Florida, JDB v. North Carolina, Miller v. Alabama, and Montgomery v. Louisiana. And these are cases we discuss in detail. But prolific doesn't really pay justice to this fierce child advocate who also spearheaded an amicus brief in support of Brendan's fight for justice, where she was joined by Wicklander Zalowski and Professor of Law Brandon Garrett in the Seventh Circuit, and again as one of six eminent alliances in the seeking of Supreme Court review. The conversation continues. 
Marsha Levick is the co-founder, deputy director and chief counsel of Juvenile Law Centre, America's oldest public interest law firm for children. Marsha spearheaded the Juvenile Law Centre's work in the Lucerne County PA Kids for Cash judges scandal and has been a powerful voice in the search for justice for the country's most vulnerable kids and in support of Brendan's fight for justice through the federal court system. Thank you so much for joining me on The Sixth Hour. You're welcome. I just wanted to touch on the Juvenile Law Centre. It's a national advocacy organisation fighting for the rights, dignity, equity and opportunity for youth in the child welfare and justice systems. And it has been instrumental in several landmark Supreme Court rulings. Can you share how the centre came to be? Sure. Um, I w- am a co-founder, as you mentioned, and we started Juvenile Law Center actually back in 1975. Uh, we just came through our 45th anniversary year, which coincided with COVID. So it was an odd time to celebrate. I started the organization with three other law students right after we graduated from law school, actually. And I, when I talk about sort of our, our origin story, I always make note of the fact that the year matters. I was in law school in the early 70s, kind of came of age in the late 60s and early 70s, which was a time of an enormous amount of social and political unrest in the United States, and certainly a time that bore witness to what feels like we're living it all over again, but an extremely critical and robust civil rights movement during the 1960s. I mention all of that to say that when we started Juvenile Law Center, we started it because we wanted to be civil rights lawyers. The field of children's rights was quite nascent in the United States. The United States Supreme Court had only in the late 60s actually just recognized children's rights under the Constitution, and in particular, children's due process rights that included the right to counsel. So we launched Juvenile Law Center to in a way, it turns out, I don't think we knew this at the beginning, really helped to build that field of children's rights lawyers. There were very few entities doing anything that we were doing. (laughs) Um, So we learned quite a bit as we went along in the beginning, but it really was about, really, it was very much about fighting for the rights of children. That's how we began. and That's why we continue to do this work. Yeah. There's no greater calling, I'd imagine. You've co-authored the lead child advocates amicus briefs in Supreme Court cases that have fundamentally altered the sentencing of children in adult courts. Can you take us through what those cases were and the impacts the rulings had? Yes, the United States, probably not, this won't be surprising to your listeners, we are known for being the most punitive justice system in the world. We represent about 5% of the world's population, and our incarcerated population typically represents about 25% of the world's incarcerated population. The juvenile justice system is fractionally quite small as compared to our criminal justice system here in the U.S., but comparatively, there's no doubt in my mind that it also incarcerates and locks up far more children than any other country across the globe. And because of that very punitive and uh, frankly, prison oriented (laughs) posture that our justice system has, we also have a very harsh sentencing structure. And we also approach crime with a very punitive philosophy. We don't distinguish all that much between children and adults. We did when we first created the juvenile court about 120 years ago. But I think in the 80s and 90s, as crime rose in the United States among both youth and adult populations, the country really embraced its punitive instincts. And we ended up prosecuting, on average, about 200,000 children a year as adults in our criminal justice system. And that included not just 
teens who were 15, 16, 17 years old. It also included in many states, kids who were 12, 13, 14 years old. The consequence of that response to youth offending was that kids were subject to the same extreme sentencing practices that we impose on adults. That led to not only the death penalty being imposed on children, but also life without parole sentences. We had an interesting confluence of sort of phenomena in the United States that led to the really upending of how we think about sentencing kids in a number of cases before the US Supreme Court. As crime was rising in the 1990s and as we were sending hundreds of thousands of kids into the adult criminal justice system, the MacArthur Foundation here in the States simultaneously and coincidentally funded a research network on adolescent development and juvenile justice. And the goal of that network wasn't to have a specific endpoint, but it was to look at the developmental traits of adolescents and see if they could connect any dots to criminal competency and criminal responsibility and blameworthiness. It turned out that they could. And as we saw more and more youth being subjected to extreme sentencing as we entered into the 21st century, that network also began publishing articles and a couple of books that began to release the results of some of the research that they were doing. And most importantly for the sentencing cases, that research demonstrated that youth were simply less blameworthy than adults because of specific developmental traits really associated with developmental immaturity that occurs through adolescence in our teen years until we all grow up, hopefully, and become adults. So beginning in 2005, the United States Supreme Court was presented with a series of challenges to these extreme sentences being imposed on children in our criminal justice system. The first case was Roper versus Simmons, which was decided in 2005. It was a challenge to the death penalty for youth under the age of 18 who had been convicted, of course, of homicide. The Supreme Court struck the juvenile death penalty. It banned it under our Eighth Amendment, an amendment to the US Constitution, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. And it did so based upon uh, almost exclusively the research that was presented to it in the form of amicus briefs outlining the findings of this MacArthur Research Network. And the court really made three specific findings uh, that it adopted in its reasoning. Number one, it recognized that kids are developmentally immature and they make poor judgments. They exercise their decision-making capacities poorly (laughs) and ineffectively. Um, The research demonstrated that youth are particularly susceptible to peer influences. If we think about ourselves as teenagers, teenagers that we know, um, they rarely go anywhere alone. (laughs) They like to be in groups. And the research really showed that that peer influence is a common trait among adolescents and that the susceptibility to negative peer influence is particularly powerful. The court also recognized, um, most importantly, I think, that adolescence is a developmental stage through which we all pass. Mm -hmm. And as we pass through that immaturity to maturity, we also uh, have an extraordinary and unique capacity, capacity as children to transform and to become rehabilitated. And putting those three qualities of youth together, immaturity of judgment, susceptibility to peer influence and capacity for change, the court ruled that children were categorically less culpable for their criminal conduct than adults. And it relied upon those research findings to strike the juvenile death penalty. Um, Five years later in 2010, the Supreme Court was presented with another extreme sentencing challenge this time to life without parole sentences for children under the age of 18 who had been convicted of non-homicide crimes. And I think the petitioner in that case, Terrence Graham, the case was Graham v. Florida, is really illustrative of how far astray U.S. sentencing policies have become. Terrence Graham at the age of 16 had been convicted of a home invasion robbery. He was initially placed on probation. He served about six months in jail, kind of awaiting trial, during trial. When he was finally sentenced, he was released on probation 
that's significant. There was no determination that mm. he needed to be further incarcerated. While he was on probation, he was suspected of having engaged in additional crimes, similar types of crimes, home invasion robberies. And rather than charge him with new offenses, his probation officer instead alerted the court that he wanted to violate his probation. The sentencing judge who had originally sentenced Terrence to probation upon learning that he was facing violent probation violations, sentenced Terrence to life without parole. Wow. I, it's, it's an extraordinary outcome. Mm. As I said, I think it really exemplifies what we in the United States often feel is, is a kind of insanity about how extreme our sentencing policies are here. Terrence challenged that sentence. Um, as I said, this was in 2010, five years after the Supreme Court's death penalty decision. And once again, the Supreme Court really relying on the exact same research and the same findings about adolescent developmental immaturity and their traits ruled the life without parole sentence for someone who was convicted of only a non-homicide offense to be unconstitutional. Significantly in 2010, the research network that I referenced earlier, their work was coming to an end, but that work had expanded into a parallel focus on brain development. And so by the time th this case came before the court in 2010, the court was also presented not only with this same body of social science research, but now there was quite a bit of information in the field and that was presented to the court about the ways in which the adolescent brain was still developing. And in particular, the frontal lobe of the brain, which houses the decision-making functions to just speak informally about it. And because it houses those decision-making functions, and it turns out that the frontal lobe is the last area of the brain to fully develop and to mature, and it actually takes until the mid-20s for that part of the brain development to be to reach completion, that it actually it, it interferes with that ability to make good judgments, to make good decisions that adolescents exhibit all the time. Yeah. Um, we all know how we might ask a teen why they did something and they will respond and we'll say, what were you thinking? And then they will say, I don't know, I wasn't thinking. Mm -hmm. So the, the brain research, the neuroscientific research really confirmed and demonstrated correlation between that neurological research and the behavioral research. Two years later, the court was presented with yet another challenge to extreme sentencing. Again, life without parole sentencing for individuals under the age of 18 who had been convicted of homicide. Now, I think it's, I, I want to note here, because this is, it, it, this is about children's sentencing, that all of the sentences that I just described as having been struck for youth under the age of 18 remain fully operational for adults. So we certainly have an active death penalty in this country. And it is not uncommon for individuals to be sentenced to life without parole if they are adults. But again, another challenge was made to the sentence for youth. And the Supreme Court in 2012 struck life without parole for youth convicted of homicide, but in a very specific way. The court only banned mandatory life without parole sentences. It didn't mm. categorically bar the sentence in any set of circumstances. In other words, it really left the possibility that judges following a sentencing hearing, following a consideration of individual characteristics, participation in the particular crime, family, social, educational, mental health circumstances, that a judge could still sentence someone under the age of 18 to life without parole. So it was a ban on mandatory sentencing. The court based that ban on it's recognition that a life without parole sentence like the death penalty is final. Honestly, it's a question of whether you die sooner or later in prison, but youth sentenced to life without parole will die in prison. The finality of that sentence led the court to require this individualized determination. And of course, mandatory sentencing is completely at odds with any kind of individualized consideration. It's a one size fits all approach. So when Miller came down, that case was Miller versus Alabama in 2012, there were about 2,000 individuals serving life without parole sentences for homicides that they had been convicted of committing under the age of 18. 
since 2012, about maybe 75%, 70 to 75% of those individuals have been resentenced across the country. The vast majority of them have not been resentenced to life without parole, and that's great news. Hundreds of them have since been released from prison and are back home in their communities. The numbers of individuals who have come home who have been rearrested is tiny. It is a probably under 5%, perhaps even less than that. It could be 1% or 2% across the country. It is an, an interesting illustration of something that research has also taught us about the crime curve, which is that individuals who commit crimes, even in their youth, there is a natural desistance that takes place. People literally grow out of committing crimes, yeah. you know, and in most instances, they grow out of that actually in their 20s, late 20s. Um, and we're seeing that here. Uh, we have hundreds of individuals who have come home here in Philadelphia, where I live and work. Mm. Many of them are working in the advocacy space. They have a, a real heartfelt desire to give back to their communities. And they are extraordinary men and women who we are very fortunate to have them back in our communities and fortunate to have given them a second chance. But all of, all of that, that research and these decisions by our court really just completely transformed how we think about juvenile crime and how we think about youth sentencing. It underscored, I think, the importance of the differences between children and adults, something that we all take for granted, I think, in our daily lives but which apparently wasn't always recognized in our criminal law and hopefully has moved us toward a more humane justice system. I think we have a long way to go, but we're inching closer. Yeah. I think one of the things that strikes me about the, the life without parole sentencing is, I'll reference Wisconsin, at the moment in the correction system, it's holding about 127 men serving life sentences for homicides when they were under 18 years of age. And wrongfully, Brendan Dassey is one of them. Yep. It almost seems like their sentences are like de facto life without parole sentences. They're sentenced to 50 plus years or 60 plus years. It's hard to find a difference. Absolutely. Um, and I think it's really important to talk about that. In the work that I do, I consider this an ongoing uh, struggle. We have, in a way reached and I think shredded the tip of the iceberg, the obvious sentences that really did condemn children to die in prison. But even as I mentioned that we've had so few individuals resentenced to life without parole following the Supreme Court decisions, we have had many of them resentenced to significant terms of years, 40, yes. 50, 60, or more years mm. in cases where there might have been two or more victims in many jurisdictions in the United States, sentencing judges can stack sentences. So someone could get 25 or 30 years to life for one victim. But if there's more than one, they could get 50, 75, 100 years. We literally have sentences in the United States that are considered life sentences of hundreds of years, yes. which is, it's silly. So yes, I mean, I, I don't, I am grateful <laughs> for the steps we've taken. Yes but very mindful that there are many, many kids who are in prison, individuals, adults who are in prison today who went in as children who still may unfortunately die in prison. It's monstrous. It's, yes. It truly yeah. is. Now, as a children's rights lawyer and national expert in juvenile law, you've dedicated your career to the protection of children. Had you been aware of Brendan Dassey's case in 2006? I, I was not aware of it. I really became aware of it through um, the making of murder. That was my exposure to his story and, of course, his uncle's story and was horrified mm. at what unfolded in front of all of our eyes. I mean, watching Brendan's interrogation tapes, I think it's safe to say elicited a visceral response in millions of people and continues to today. I see wave after wave of people who are new to making a murderer and then their outrage and then what can I do to help? Can you recall watching the tapes and, and what were your thoughts at the time? 
Um, I, as I said, I, I was really horrified. Um, I, I should add that in between the Supreme Court sentencing cases, in 2011, the Supreme Court decided another case involving police interrogation of children. That case was JDB versus North Carolina, a case that actually Juvenile Law Center had been extensively involved in, both in two state appeals out of North Carolina and then before the United States Supreme Court. We had written, written I guess, three or four amicus briefs at that point. The outcome in that case was that the Supreme Court applied the same developmental research that it looked to in the sentencing cases to conclude that law enforcement, police generally, had to take a different approach to interrogating children, particularly with respect to when they gave us something that is so American, these so-called Miranda warnings, which are really about informing individuals of their right to counsel and their right to remain silent and their right to appointed counsel if they can't afford one. These are foundational in our criminal justice system, but until 2011, our courts, state courts, federal courts, law enforcement generally had all treated children and adults the same and assumed that whatever rules apply to adults, we could also apply to children. With the developmental research in front of it, the Supreme Court, of course, had to recognize that actually, again, the differences between children and adults required a different perspective. So I was keenly aware of the risks attendant to the interrogation of children by law enforcement. What happens when kids feel cornered? The ways in which law enforcement can be quite creative in making it appear that they're not <laughs> cornering someone. Yes. And so that was in my head when I was watching the documentary. And for me, it, visceral is the right word. I, I was watching it and I just felt the pressure. No one was beating him. No one was chaining him. No one was screaming at him. But I felt the pressure that he felt to tell the story they wanted him to tell. And it was painful to watch. It, it absolutely was. I, um, I think it's been a catalyst for, for a lot of advocacy since the, uh, the release of Making a Murderer. But I've also read your articles for the Huffington Post and others in support of Brendan. And in the December of 2016, you filed a motion for leave to file brief of Amici Curie ahead of the oral arguments at the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. In this, you were joined by Wicklander Zalowski and Professor Brandon Garrett. Can you explain the perspective you were bringing to the court via the amicus? Well, I think that we, we saw in Brendan's case, really, I think, a stark framing of the problem that confronts interrogation generally of suspects in the United States. And that is that we are really incredibly tolerant as a society, but I think our courts reflect that, are incredibly tolerant of both extreme and also subtle pressure in interrogations. Our Supreme Court is constantly balancing uh, individual rights during interrogation with the desire to solve crimes and the notion that so long as you can solve a crime, you are keeping communities safe. And we saw in Brendan's case, because it wasn't screaming and yelling and beating up and depriving of food, it wasn't those overt things that frankly have happened historically in the United States during police interrogations. It wasn't that, it was more subtle. And therefore, of course, in many respects, much more dangerous because you, you you had to understand what was going on. You had to watch as Brendan transformed from someone who was, was readily <laughs> denying his guilt to someone who before our eyes over the course of those four episodes of, of his interrogation came to admit his involvement. And we really wanted to be a part of the chorus of voices that tried to bring reason to this process. It was deeply disappointing, of course, that although we initially won in the Court of Appeals, um, that decision was reversed by a, the full panel of that Court of Appeals and then the United States Supreme Court denied review. It is, I, I think, he is not alone 
every year there are false confessions that are relied upon and made by children because of our interrogation practices. But his case, because we could all watch it and we could see it and we could see that slow transformation from no to yes, it just seemed to typify in a way everything that is wrong with police interrogation of children in this country. Yeah. And of course, the the jurors who ended up deciding Brendan's fate weren't privy to the full four interrogations, including Marionette County, to see right. how they brought Brendan Dassey to the March 1st statement. Yeah. Um, in, in regards to filing uh, amicus briefs, is the Juvenile Law Centre invited to file or is the centre proactive in aligning itself with cases? Um, I think that's a great question. I'm glad that you asked that. Uh, it's mostly that we are proactive, mostly that we, at this point, because we have been around for so long, we do work across the country. We have colleagues in every jurisdiction who are on the ground in the trenches of bringing these issues before the courts and may reach out to us directly, or we will be tracking cases that they're working on. And as they move up through our appellate system here in the U.S., we will offer our assistance. There have been instances where we have been invited by courts to file amicus briefs. I can think of three specific states um, over the course of the last 15 years or so, Nevada, Wisconsin, actually Wisconsin, Michigan, and Massachusetts, four jurisdictions, that just because of a particular issue that was coming up before the, those particular state Supreme Courts, may have reached out to us directly, may have reached out to us and colleagues in the American Civil Liberties Union, for example, other well-known advocacy organizations soliciting amicus briefs in cases where they understood at the outset that the issue was novel, that the issue was important. So we, at this point, um, we now try to keep data on our work in this space. We probably file 40 to 50 amicus briefs a year. That's a lot. Obviously, that's close to one a week. And in any given year, we're probably in a dozen or more different states doing that work. So it is, it's a very much a part of the way that we think about law reform and about advocacy. Mm. Yeah. You're quoted as saying that Brendan's case is of exceptional importance to the national community of advocates seeking to defend the constitutional rights of children. And you authored and led the charge in the second amicus brief in support of Brendan's request for a Supreme Court review. Was the intervention and the perspective that you were wanting to bring the same as in the one that was filed at the Seventh Circuit? It was in the sense that for us, when you have a case that is as egregious as Brendan's, it's incredibly important that there be both a multitude of voices and, of course, a variety of voices who are speaking out. And, you know, it's interesting that the, the, sort of the same thing happened in the JDB case that I mentioned, which had to do with custodial interrogation of children before the US Supreme Court. That case was equally pretty egregious on the facts. A 13-year-old had been pulled out of a classroom in his middle school, taken into a closed-door conference room, surrounded by four adults, two uniformed officers, and then the vice principal and an administrator in his middle school questioned about his involvement in a petty larceny in his neighborhood. He ultimately was really pressured to confess his involvement. It wasn't a false confession. That was not the issue there, but only after he gave his statement was he then advised of his right to have a lawyer and to not actually implicate himself. The decision to nevertheless ignore the circumstances under which he was interrogated were affirmed by two appellate courts in North Carolina, and it took the U.S. Supreme Court to fix that. And we felt the same way about Brendan's case, and, and I, to this day, despite being dismayed that it ultimately was reversed in the Seventh Circuit, even more dismayed that the U.S. Supreme Court didn't take the case up because we know that the lower courts don't always get it right. Brendan's conviction had obviously also been appealed. 
and affirmed by the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Shockingly, how could that be? Yes. Nevertheless affirmed. And it was really precisely the kind of case that one thinks should capture at the end of the day, the attention of the U.S. Supreme Court. I remain mystified that they didn't take it, frankly. We'll never know <laughs> unless I, yeah. I run into, you know, a clerk of some of the justices maybe down the road and they can share. We'll never really know what the reasoning was. But I, I just think the, the facts and the circumstances are plain for anyone to see. And there was a record, right? We had a record. We had a film that showed us <laughs> everything yes. that went wrong there. It's really very, very important that the court take this case and model for state and federal courts how one evaluates a confession by a juvenile and a juvenile with rather significant intellectual and social deficits. I think the entire country has an interest in having the Supreme Court hear this case. I mean, every one of us wants a system of criminal justice that ferrets out the perpetrators of crime and punishes them appropriately, but that also respects the individual liberties on which our country was founded. And I think at the time that Brendan's advocate, legal advocates, said that it, was, it would be the first time in over 40 years that the High Court would hear a case concerning the voluntariness of a juvenile exactly. confession. Yes, that's correct. Why do you think advances in neuroscience and adolescent behaviour research has not been adopted by the higher courts in determining voluntariness? This wasn't just a missed opportunity, obviously, for Brendan, but for juvenile reform across the board? I think it is, again, I think it's this tension between solving crimes and the protection of individual rights. The Miranda decision, which gave rise to this thing called the Miranda warnings, which was decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in the 1960s, was groundbreaking at the time. The notion that people being questioned had this right to actually have counsel assist them wasn't of note. It wasn't a matter of law until the 60s. But since then, each of the other configurations of the U.S. Supreme Court that have come along in the last 50 some years, 60 years, have pulled back step by step aspects of what we originally thought the Miranda ruling was about. And what I mean by that is they have tampered with what it means to actually ask for a lawyer. They have ruled that if a certain amount of time passes, you do or don't have to re-Mirandize someone. Little things along the way that tilt things just slightly in favor, a little bit of a thumb on the scale in favor of law enforcement. It's almost like a kind of buyer's remorse. And it's in that context, recognizing that the Supreme Court has not expanded Miranda. It has been pulling back on it. And we are, as children's rights lawyers, here we are trying to push the court to go in the opposite direction, to in fact expand the notion of individual rights during questioning for children. And I, you know, I'm, I'm speculating wildly here. <laughs> I think there's a disconnect. There's a there's this tension that exists, and one would one would think, you know, this concept of voluntariness. And I know that Brendan's lawyers, you know, they really did push this idea. I think in the federal courts, certainly back up to the U.S. Supreme Court, that the last decision concerning voluntariness was a 1979 decision, Fair versus Michael C. And, and there, the court, in an equally, I think, if we sit. And think about it today, the issue there was that Michael had asked to see his probation officer as he was being interrogated by the police because he thought his probation officer was someone who would help him and advise him. But because he didn't ask for a lawyer specifically, those magic words, the U.S. Supreme Court said that he clearly, the interrogation was fine. He never asked for a lawyer. 
that's the last word that the US Supreme Court has spoken about the voluntariness of children's confessions. And in the face of everything that we know now about how children's reasoning is really impaired in a way during their adolescence, their ability to just assess what's going on around them, to understand the consequences of the decisions that they're making, to resist the pressure from any authority figure, whether they're uniformed or not, whether they have a gun on their hip or not, whether it's in school or outside of school, that it is necessarily compromised. Of course, who would question that? Of course it's compromised. But I think it is this persistent need to protect the prerogative of law enforcement to solve crimes and just completely equating, conflating that with public safety. And I think so long as we continue to elevate that concern, uh, we will continue to do a disservice to certainly children in America. Absolutely. Absolutely. The the Miranda question with Brandon, for example, is he was read so many different variations of the Miranda warning for somebody of Brendan's intellectual limitations and obviously his social limitations as well for him to try and comprehend or piece together the different warnings that he was given was obviously impossible. Yes. And to waive his rights or to invoke his rights, I very much doubt that somebody or a juvenile like Brendan would have been across any of that. Well, and I think it's, you know, it goes even further than that. You can watch that and we can see how listening to it, the Miranda warnings are really about things that are quite abstract. What does it mean that you have a right not to incriminate yourself or you have a right to remain silent? That's very confusing to children or what a right to a lawyer actually means or counsel, whatever they were, the word they use. An interesting bit of research that's been done in the last several years has been around, well, maybe we should come up with child-friendly Miranda warnings. And what that research has shown is the opposite. What happens when we try to rewrite the Miranda warnings so that they are more intelligible for children so they can understand them, we make them longer. (laughs) We explain everything in three different sentences or four different sentences. And it turns out that that process of making them longer, giving youth more information to process does not increase and does not enhance their understanding of what the warnings are actually about. So when when I began to, you know, sort of read about and be exposed to that research, I think it really increased my own feeling of this is just silly. <laughs> this is this is not a game that children can win. This is not set up to assist children, to inform children, to protect children. And that it's ridiculous to think that we can fix this. And so any kind of interrogation of youth um, as they are really becoming suspects as the police are are really zeroing in on them for their potential participation in a crime, I certainly don't think can occur now without counsel being present. Yeah. I mean, touching on policy reform, we've seen successful movements through cases such as State v. Gerald, which resulted in the recording of custodial interrogations in Wisconsin where I believe Brandon was the first juvenile to be electronically recorded. Mm -hmm. But we see in practice that unless judges and jurors are educated and embrace the science surrounding false confessions, for example, the recording cannot overcome the notion that innocent people don't confess. So what further reforms would you recommend to really make an impact in protecting kids in the interrogation room? Well, I I would be absolutist about it. I just don't think they can be interrogated without a lawyer being present. All of the reforms that are out there, having a parent present, there are a number of states across the United States that require a so-called interested adult, which in most cases will be a parent, be present in the room while kids are being interrogated. That's not helpful because there are so many documented examples of parents, understandably, telling their children, just tell the truth, right? That's the value that we teach our children, tell the truth. The notion of being in a room with our kids being interrogated and saying, don't tell them anything. Don't tell them anything that you might've done. It's it's almost 
contrary to how we think about our role as parents instilling values in our children. So while that is, I would almost say the majority view in the U.S. to the extent that there are states that are legislating in this space, they favor the idea of an interested adult over a lawyer. It's a folly. It's a folly. It's not going to fix the problem for kids. The videotaping is another interesting one. We increasingly recognize that there's lots of tricks that can be played with videotapes. Whose angle is the videotape capturing? When is the video camera turned on? When is the video camera turned off? What, what are we seeing? What aren't we seeing? And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you an anecdote about Brendan's interrogation and even the fact that it was captured for anyone who wanted to see it for hours during the course of, of the documentary. Because I teach a law school class on juvenile justice, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about interrogations and we talked specifically about Brendan's case. And a number of the students in my class had seen uh, Making a Murder and so that they were well aware of the footage of the interrogation there. And there was at least one student who said, you know, it doesn't really look like he was under a lot of pressure. <laughs> and that's, that response comes from this assumption we have grown up with in this country that pressure is abuse. Pressure is beating someone up. Pressure is, you know, put, shining a bright light on them and playing loud music and starving them. I'm not appreciating the very subtle psychological coercion and cajoling that happened throughout that interrogation. So, so even there where you have a videotape that you and I might say, who, do, who doesn't get this? How do you not see what was happening here? People didn't always get it. They didn't always see what was happening there. So I have become weary <laughs> of reforms. I, I am weary of anything short of providing for counsel because I literally don't think there's any other way to really confidently protect the rights of kids during interrogation. Yeah, the idea of the subtle coercion is like a form of grooming, particularly in Brendan's case as well, because there were, you know, the four, five interrogations really, including March the 1st where Brendan was, was groomed and, and coerced into adopting a narrative yeah. that he certainly didn't start out with. I noticed on the Law Centre's website that it states around 250,000 youth enter the adult criminal justice system each year. That is staggering. That is staggering. Yeah, so the number is less now. And if that's the current number on our website, we'll be sure to fix it. So that is definitely the number I mentioned during the 1990s. Perhaps your listeners are aware of the super predator myth here that was really driving criminal and juvenile justice policy, um, really pushing legislators to prosecute children in the adult system. A jogger murdered in New York Central Park. A little girl gunned down in her family's car in Los Angeles. A judge has sentenced two boys for killing another child who refused to steal candy for them. There's a tidal wave of juvenile violent crime right over the horizon. And some who study it say the worst is yet to come. Life in the 1990s was dominated by a sense that youth violence was out of control. The future looked bleak. To explain why, one word said it all super predators. Some social scientists and criminologists looked at the data and saw doom. They stepped out of their ivory towers and into the public arena to sound the alarm about a coming wave of kids who were going to ravage the country. A super predator is a young juvenile criminal who is so impulsive, so remorseless, that he can kill, rape, maim without a, a, giving it a second thought. The prediction was terrifying, and lawmakers cracked down on juvenile offenders. During those years and in the immediate aftermath, we, hundreds of thousands of kids were, were being prosecuted as adults. The numbers now, the data is not terrific, frankly, but the numbers now are believed to be closer to around 60 or 70,000, so quite a drop. Yeah, absolutely. But I can assure you that there's no country in the world <laughs> <laughs> that has numbers that even approach 70,000. Yeah. It's still a stunningly high number. Yeah. 
The, the juvenile super predator myth uh, led to many states enacting laws that increased the number of juveniles subjected to adult criminal court jurisdiction. The theory was responsible for a spike in juvenile life without parole sentencing in Wisconsin. Would that have been a typical response across the states at that time? Yes, there was, you know, as I said, the U.S. has a history of really being tough on crime. Tough on crime has been a a driving winning slogan for decades in politics here in the United States. It has waned more recently because crime has dropped so significantly over the course. Interestingly, really the last 20 years, crime has been down in the U.S. So there's been some isolated upticks and certainly there has been a little bit of an uptick in some violent crime during COVID. But by and large, we are in a low crime phase right now. But the, the fear that rising crime in the 80s and early 90s propelled across the country, propelled legislators to do, like they, they were jumping over each other to do more. <laughs> Who could be the most punitive? Who could be the most aggressive in passing strict criminal laws and and in particular criminal sanctions. I think to some degree it began, frankly, with the responses in the early 80s to drug laws and that willingness that we saw for nonviolent crimes, for drug laws to impose really draconian sentences, decades, on individuals who were involved in distribution or not even just in, uh, you know, selling or grooming others to be involved in that process. It just created a climate here where I I often say, you know, there's no sentence is too long in the U.S. I think that we have a, I think, a toxic conversation that historically goes on between prosecutors and victims and victim advocates who really have spun a myth, I would say, to victims of crime and surviving family members that your closure comes from locking someone up for the rest of their lives, mm. locking someone away, yeah. which which is not at all really connected to the grief that they experience and the kind of healing that they need. So we, there are so many things I think that come together in the U.S. that have come together for decades, trying to undo that mindset uh, that the response to crime is simply punishment. There is no other response. Uh, certainly contributed to a willingness to bring this back to Brendan's case, you know, a willingness of jurors to believe what they hear, a willingness of judges to sentence. (laughs) Brendan was sentenced to over 40 years in prison, a young man who not only is his complicity certainly questionable, I certainly think it was an entirely false confession, but it should have been somewhat questionable to anybody listening but also the willingness to to punish someone for that long who was so young at the time of the crime. Yeah, absolutely. And particularly when you have cases where there are well-documented systemic failures that bring that child to that place of you know, conviction and sentencing. In 2019, there were two bills introduced to Congress. The Next Step Act, which would allow a court to reduce a prison sentence imposed on a juvenile offender once he or she served not less than 20 years. And a related bill, the Second Look Act, which went further in expanding that review for all persons once they have served at least 10 years of a sentence that was greater than 10 years. Do you know if anything came of them? And what would the Juvenile Law Centre lobby for regarding mandatory minimums for youths? Well, that's that's also a great question. You know, in the wake of the U.S., Supreme Court sentencing cases um, on juvenile life without parole. There have been, I think, 26, maybe very close to that number, states across the country since 2012 that have revised their sentencing laws. Many of them have eliminated life without parole. In fact, probably now the majority of states in the U.S. no longer permit a life without parole sentence for a juvenile, even a juvenile convicted of homicide. But many of those laws provide for that first look, that first opportunity for parole eligibility or release after 20 or 25 years. So a couple of jurisdictions, West Virginia, for example, here would do that second look, that first look after 15 years in California, it can be done, um, I think, around 15 years. The average, though, 
post Miller, post the US Supreme Court decisions is 25 years or more in my state of Pennsylvania, youth serving term of year sentences will not get an opportunity for parole before either 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, or 35 years, depending upon how old they were, whether they were 15 and older or younger than 15. In my heart, that's too long. Is that better than life without parole? Is that better than sentencing these young men and women to die in prison? Yes. Is it better for them to have their sentences re-examined and re-evaluated after 20, 20 years? Yes. Is 20 years too long? Yes. Yeah. We are, again, we are pushing this rock up a hill in this country where because we are wedded to punishment and because we are wedded to incarceration and we are wedded to long-term sentences, something, something shorter looks good. Yes. Right. But my, my dream, you know, I really, well, I, I think I have a couple of dreams here. One is I really believe now based on everything that we know about children and everything that science has exposed about the immaturity of children and their capacity for change that like most of the rest of the world, we shouldn't be trying any children in adult court. I think it is a wrong-headed response to criminal offending by children. The vast majority of kids, they, they will grow out of it. They will benefit from programming. They will become rehabilitated. And we should allow research to drive our policies and not emotion to drive those policies. To the extent that we, if we had to pick a number, I would certainly not pick a number higher than 10. And I say that because, again, I'm willing to trust research. And the research shows that this sort of natural desistance occurs in the mid to late 20s. So to the extent that we have youth being convicted of criminal conduct of homicide as teenagers, most of them will be 10 years later in their mid to late 20s. And we should be looking then at that moment in time at who they have become. But of course, that's also contingent upon providing for programming and educational opportunities and other services that allow them to experience that natural growth and development that other kids will see. But that's a fallback position. I, I really think that, as I said, we, we need to join the rest of the world if we really want to have a, not just a, an effective, but also a humane justice system. I think yes. we need to keep kids in the juvenile court. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, the United States is one of the few countries to not have ratified the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Mm -hmm. And that's a legal framework that promises to every child to protect and fulfill their rights. And, and that childhood is separate from adulthood and lasts until 18. Do you think if the US ratified that convention that it would offer a layer of protection not currently available to children in the system? I think it would, because what, what's happened, and, and I've had the benefit more recently of being in conversations um, with colleagues from around the world, including colleagues in Australia, where we have had the conversation about the difference between really looking to the UN Convention as a driving force and as a principal document about how we deal with children versus the US that has not ratified it, as you said, and it is really absent from any kind of conversation or discourse here. What's happened here in the US is that it was really the developmental science, the developmental research, the neuroscience that pushed our US Supreme Court to adapt our constitution and our view of children's constitutional rights. It wasn't based on a principled view of human dignity and human rights that I think the UN Convention represents. So, that's absent from our discussion here. I can't make an argument in court in the United States about someone's human rights unless I tie that very specifically really to children's rights that is driven by what research teaches us about children and about their vulnerability and about their unique qualities. I would love to have the UN Convention <laughs> available yes. here. I think it yeah. is an expansive and an essential view of, of individuals generally, but certainly of children and their, and their human dignity and their human rights. 
and recognizing that they needed to be treated, they need to be treated in accordance with those principles and with those values. Absolutely. I think it's, it's Article 37 that states no child should be subjected to torture or other cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. Neither capital punishment nor life imprisonment without possibility of release shall be imposed for offences committed by persons below 18 years of age. Now, I know in Australia we adopted the convention. I think it was around 1990. But again, there are many of us who are actively lobbying our federal government to raise the age of criminal liability. At the moment, it's 10 years of age. They're looking to raise it to 14, which I, like personally, I still think is too young. You know, I I have a 14-year-old son. I just can't imagine him going through the system. But unfortunately, our First Nations youth is disproportionately impacted by our juvenile justice system. And on an average night across Australia, for example, there are around 993 young people in detention and 83% of those are aged between 10 and 17. And unfortunately, our young Indigenous Australians are 21 times more likely than non-Indigenous Australians to be in detention. And we've adopted the convention. I think there's, there's a lot of room for movement in what we do here as well in, in the juvenile justice system. There is uh, room for reform. Well, we, we know that um, there has been a lot of robust discussion outside of the U.S. Uh, currently about raising the age of criminal responsibility to 14. We are just beginning to have that conversation here in the U.S., and I think we're going to see more energy behind that. That feels like a very steep hill to climb, given the history of of how we have looked at youth committing crimes. But I think it's the right number. I agree. You know, we probably could go higher. In Pennsylvania, that number is 10. You know, the weird thing about the United States, of course, is that we have 50 different systems of juvenile justice through 50 state systems. The probably most states hover around 10 across the U.S. Some have no lower age of criminal responsibility, which is really stunning. Wow. And some are around 12, kind of hover around 12. So so that's very much a conversation that we're having here. I'm glad that you brought up the issue about Indigenous uh, Australians because race is obviously top of the mind right now in the U.S., as it should be. Mm. The Black Lives Matter movement and the um, the protests through the spring and summer here, once again, because it's not as if we haven't had this conversation before, but once again, really elevated the the real harm of structural racism in this country and the degree to which racism pervades our juvenile and adult criminal justice system. So we have similar kinds of numbers. The disproportionality that youth of color face, both brown and black youth face when they interact with the police, when they're arrested, when they're charged, when they're sentenced, when they're detained, up and down every level of interaction with the justice system, the discrimination is rampant. So we are struggling with that here. I think there is a lot of energy right now among many policy makers and decision makers to try to finally confront the historic racism uh, that has just really infected every aspect of American society, but especially our justice system. So we'll see, you know, we're, I would say I'm hopeful. I don't know if I'm optimistic. I'm yeah. hopeful that we're engaged in these conversations and that perhaps we can, we can begin to reverse some of the patterns and practices that have been so just persistent here. In your TED Talk, America's Juvenile and Justice System, a line that stayed with me is, justice for children is one of America's great unfulfilled promises. And I think this is very true of Brendan Dassey. Do you think the system has learned anything from what has happened and continues to happen to Brandon? I don't know. I, honestly, I don't see a movement sweeping the country, as I said, to require counsel at every station house interrogation, every time a youth is interrogated by some member of law enforcement. We're seeing some legislative reforms that are kind of fixated on this idea of the interested adult. I think that 
legislators here don't want to take on the financial responsibility of providing counsel for every child subject to interrogation. So it becomes a matter of economics. How much money is a child's right worth? I'd like to think that it created an outcry, but I, I, I sadly, I don't think it did. I don't think there is yet this sort of universal gut-wrenching reaction, right? It's a gut-wrenching reaction if you can watch it and understand what's happening, that that happens every day. And there are multiple videos that any one of us could access online of interrogations that lasted an hour, that lasted a few hours, where you see the same extraordinary movement from no to yes, based upon this simple skill set of the interrogators, case after case of what we come to know are false confessions. So no, I, I don't think it I don't think it has propelled a movement for change in the way that those of us who are too steeped in it, the horror that we feel, I don't think necessarily radiates outward. Yeah. And as you said before, you know, Brendan's case is high profile, yet sadly the circumstances aren't. And Brendan is an innocent man and still a child in many ways. What would you like to see? What would be the outcome you would like to see for Brendan Dassey? I'd like to see him released. You know, the, he has amazing lawyers representing him who are close friends and colleagues of mine. They uh, certainly can't go any higher than the U.S. Supreme Court. I think that they can certainly try to seek clemency or pardon I don't currently know exactly what other legal avenues they're pursuing at this moment. They're limited, but the idea that he will spend 40 years in prison is heartbreaking. Just absolutely heartbreaking. Yeah, it's outrageous. (laughs) Now, if you could leave those who support Brendan, and there are thousands and thousands of what I think are ordinary people doing extraordinary things and by ordinary I mean awesome if you could leave them with some thoughts what would they be well you know I think that universal outcry is good (laughs) continuing to condemn what feels like a rather obvious injustice here I think is important I think it is unfortunate that the U.S. is so much a victim of its celebrity culture. We saw over the course of the last few years that, you know, the phrase, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, that when you had a, an especially uh, well-known celebrity um, with large social media followings who took on, took up the cause of one individual, they achieved success. They caught somebody's attention uh, who was able to make a difference. Is that what we need for Brendan? Do we need some sort of champion like that? You know, I've been a lawyer for over 40 years. I'd like to think that that in the end, the law gets it right. <laughs> uh, that it's not about who's making the claim, but rather what the claim is. But I don't know. So I think that to the extent that people um, are, are interested, they're educated, they're aware, they're thinking about Brendan. We need to keep this conversation. We need to keep the noise going. And I hope that he will get out, as I said, way before um, serving just an awful 40 years in prison. Well, thank you so much, Marsha. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for having this conversation. No, it's, it's been my pleasure. And to have these conversations with people like yourself is, is just incredible. So many thank yous. Terrific. Thank you so much. As I said, I really, really think it's great that you have um, taken up this issue. It, It deserves worldwide attention. is innocent and I know that no judge not the state trial judge 
not the state court of appeals judges, not the federal district judge, not any of the judges on, on the Seventh Circuit, including the four judges sitting on bank who denied his petition, and not a single justice on the Supreme Court of the United States thinks otherwise. I don't, no judge has ever written that they thought that Mike, that Brendan Dassey was not innocent. That isn't the question that they presented, but it is the question that we are presenting to the governor and the board in this case. And we ask for very belated, but so desperately needed justice for this man. Thank you.